Are you a businesswoman who's finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. If you want to see how your presentation skills are doing, please go to our free four-minute assessment at www.speakforresultsquiz.com. Elizabeth uses her 30 years of experience as an opera director to help business professionals become better presenters. This special series explores the relationship between business and art. And now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. This is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on how you can use your presentation skills to get a result, to move your listeners to take action. We're also talking a lot about the leadership that it takes to step up and be a presenter and the visibility that's important. And today, this is part of our special series, The Relationship Between Business and Art. Before we begin, I want to invite you to go to our free four-minute assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where your presentation skills are strong and where maybe you might need a little extra support. So today, I am delighted to welcome my friend, Filippo Petteni. Filippo, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, Great to be here. Oh, great. But this is, uh, Filippo is, I say, the art lawyer, quote unquote, but he's a lot more than that. He's an advisor, um, originally Italian, recently based in London, working internationally. And the official bio is that His main focus and background is in dealing with high-value commercial and multi-party litigation matters and art law, which is an area that he's practiced for over 15 years. He covers contentious and non-contentious work where he advises galleries, artists, uh, collectors, auction houses, and other professionals within the art market. That means that you deal with them when they're happy to talk to you and you deal with them when they're fighting, right? (laughs) Yes. He also regularly deals with art-based litigation and has handled a number of high-profile disputes concerning authenticity both in and out of the court. He told me the other day that he is a nexus between the legal world, the business world, and the art world, connecting and bridging the gap and the divide. So, Filippo, so happy to have you here. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you. Before we get into high-stakes negotiation and so forth, the question I ask all my guests is, if you were to have a dream interview with someone who's no longer with us, who would you interview? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? Um, so for me, um, it would be, certainly within the art sphere, it would be um, one of the 20th century's foremost art historians, Ernst Gombrich. Uh, he was Austrian. Who is who? Sorry? Ernst Gombrich. Ernst Gombrich, okay. He was uh, Austrian-born um, and uh, emigrated to uh, the UK with the Warburg Institute in the 1930s and was immensely influential um, at the time uh, in kind of shaping um, a, this kind of transition between a, a connoisseurship type approach uh, to art to a more what we'd recognize as more kind of modern approach to, to the history of art. Um, he, he wrote specifically about perception in the context of art and how we view art, how we perceive it, and, and the progress of art. He's probably better known, and this is why um, I chose him, for having written a book called The Story of Art, which 
has the great credit of um, popularizing and rendering accessible a subject matter that, you know, for many was considered elitist or non-accessible. Um, and that's how I encountered him as a teenager. Sort of 13, I think, was the first time I read, I read the book. And it altered the way um, I related to art and um, the way I saw art. Um, I, th I think probably a better way of now, we'd probably look at that book and instead of calling it the story of art, we, we might call it, uh, we might rename it a story of art because it's certainly, yes. yeah, it's certainly Eurocentric in, in, in its approach. It was written by a white male for a, pre a predominantly white male audience. And so uh, women don't have a huge um, you know, huge scope in this in, in this book, and certainly art of you know, Asian art or African art, or which has its own um, multitude of, of of histories that are just as rich as as a Western tradition, aren't really in, included in it. But he was sort of a fascinating individual, uh, immensely erudite and 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 learned. And um, the question I'd ask him would be why is art so important? You know, why is art so important uh -huh. for us all? And yeah. I would hope that uh, politicians would be, and children, often, you know, they're on the same level, um, <laughs> would, yes. be, would be listening. Um, because I think, you know, now more than ever, uh, having a creative outlet, uh, um, an understanding of a creative process is something that's critical for us. Yeah, I would love to interview him. I'm curious, uh, having, I grew up in a family where um, my grandmother was an artist and very interested in art. So we, uh, totally Eurocentric though, that mm -hmm. was important. Uh, so I learned about art from her and from, from my family, Somewhat in school, but not so much. When you're growing up in Italy, how much, how much do they teach you about the famous art that the rest of us travel to Italy to go see? I think if, if you're, um, when I was in Italy, I was in, in British schools. Uh, uh -huh. Because we, uh, I grew up between Italy, uh, the UK and France to a certain degree. Um, the the Italian system, historically, there was a great focus on art, but taught in a particular way. I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's a contemporary view of how art history should be approached, but um, it's also something there that's easily relatable uh, because you, you walk out of school and you might, you know, as a teenager, you might just on that particular day that perhaps your teacher's spoken to you about I know, Renaissance architecture, as you're walking past a building, you might notice it. Um, mm -hmm. Regrettably, um, but, and, and, and certainly in my case, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a, a family that appreciated art. My grandfather was uh, a collector, and um, I was involved I was sort of brought in by him and kind of educated by him to, to, to a certain degree. Um, I always tell this story that he would have me go and uh, pick up when, when I lived in London, um, again in my teens, have me go and, and, and pick up auction catalogues ah. from um, Sotheby's or Christie's. And uh, when I'd visit him in Italy, I would, you know, come armed with these catalogs and we talk about certain works of art and I, you know, I'd say, well, I, this is, I think you should buy this or, you know, not knowing anything really about the prices or um, what his interests were. I found out years later that uh, he would receive all of those catalogs by post in any case. So <laughs> he would, it was definitely a sort of... Um, rather sneaky way of, of, of wanting me to be exposed to, to, to that world. Um, yeah. Well, as we're talking about auction houses and catalogs, uh, you know, art has always been, there's always been a business aspect to it. I think about Michelangelo needing to get money from the mm -hmm. Pope in order to paint the Sistine Chapel. 
and and it was Michelangelo who was committed to painting that could have been somebody else you know Michelangelo would have had to fight to get that commission and then lived off of it right yeah I mean it was um uh, it was an interesting um, r relationship at that time. And, and the, the business, there's always been business in art. Mm -hmm. um, I think the art business uh, is a, a more recent phenomenon. But I mean, if, the if art we, business we know. The art business as, as we know it, as we would yeah. recognize it. I mean, looking at that relationship of patronage that would have existed with workshops, etc., at the time of, of Michelangelo, that's very, very different from the development, but the, the the sort of key steps which have led to the the business of art as as we see it now, which were, in my mind, essentially the the creation of academies uh, for the study of art, um, museums, and then the establishment of dealers. Um, uh -huh. in, in and and we're looking, you know, that process took. A couple of hundred of uh, hundreds of years to, to sort of come to fruition and leads to a kind of fledgling market that we would almost recognize but we're looking at 40 50 years for something that is you know kind of high stakes big numbers um we'll look really since the 70s is is, is something that's more akin to, to to what we're seeing now and you know who knows what it'll be post covid so we are talking about the theme of this uh of this series is the relationship between business and art. And I was thinking that, that say negotiating the sale of a Picasso would be um, similar to a merger and acquisition between two companies. How do you approach high stakes negotiation like that? Something like, I mean, some of it has to do clearly with how you establish value. So that's yeah, where the dealers I mean, come in, right? Um, it's the dealers and um, there's, there, there's a, a very complex way of establishing value on one hand. And on the other, it's, it's very simple. It's, you know, the, the value is what someone's prepared to pay for a particular piece. Mm -hmm. um, the, it is idiosyncratic. I mean, there is business within the art world and there are very high figures involved. And there's a big sale yesterday at Christie's um, where, you know, there were paintings that were sold in excess of $40 million. Um, oh. But it's that sort of, it's in the, the numbers where the similarity really stops because um, you're looking at uh, an industry that is relatively unregulated compared to business, compared to the, uh -huh, okay. the universe within which mergers and acquisitions would take place. There, there's um, almost a sort of standardized procedure that, that's followed when a merger takes place. There are data rooms, there's information gathering and sharing, and you know all of that is largely missing from, from an art world transaction and what's at the forefront of, of that reality is an individual who wants a piece uh -huh. so um i think aside from the the numeric value that's where the sort of similarities stop but there is there's there are lessons to be learned from from an art. That related. was my next question. Exactly. An art related. How could, how could a, a, someone who's not dealing with a Forty million dollar painting. How? What could we learn from the sort of negotiation and the sort of sales that you help facilitate? You help put together. Well, I, th I think the, the fundamental aspect is information gathering, and that is that's common with the process that you would go through in a merger or an acquisition. I mean. If you're buying a multi, if you're buying anything that has of that has a value to you, um, you should do your homework. You should do your research. You should ask questions about the provenance. Ask questions about the condition. Um, see where it's been exhibited. We're talking about art here, or mm -hmm. uh, has it? Does it? Um, is it? Does it form part of the catalogue raisonné of the particular artist? So that, you know the bible that. 
um, encapsulates all of the work of, of a given artist. So, and um, so do do your homework, do your research. Firstly, secondly, know um, know your limits. I mean, set in advance of the negotiation sort of conditions which you're not prepared to deviate from. And um, whilst flexibility is, as we know, is fundamental in negotiations, there has to be a point, particularly in something that is um, by some described as a sort of a passion asset um, where logic and business sense and reason um, often are very far away from the negotiations themselves, um, set limits, set criteria. Beyond this price, I'm not you know, prepared to go. Um, understand how and why that price was set. Uh, that's easier in gallery sales or uh, when looking at auction, auction sales. There's very little data that's publicly available. So uh, aside from auction data, um, but, you know, ask a dealer, why is it they've, gone, they've, they've come to that price? Um, and I guess as, a, uh, as an adjunct to do your research is understand the triggers, the needs and wants of those involved in the, the negotiations, which is key for negotiations where individuals are concerned uh, rather than a commercial imperative. Well, actually, that, that takes me to my next question is how would we apply these lessons to a personal negotiation, such as negotiating a raise or your salary, your incoming salary, if you're coming into a new company? And, and I, I was going to ask this as a separate question, but I think this is all part of it, is emotion. And you, you called it a passion project or a passion asset. How do we think, how do we keep the emotion, emotion will play a part. Yeah. So how do we, how do we think about that? What, what can we learn about that from selling well, a Picasso, say? Yeah, well, well, I think part of, um, I mean, often art sales, I, I would say just as a premise, occur in, uh, you know, the, the, there's a famous adage that art sales occur when, you know, death uh, divorce or taxes are involved. And that's mm. clearly not the only set of circumstances, but um, that sales often occur in contexts that are charged with a whole series of other things. Um, so I think some of what I said earlier certainly applies um, to, to remove some of that emotion or give a, uh, a context to, to that emotion. So the research, the knowing and understanding the pricing and, um, and some of the drivers help understand uh, or help inform the, the framework within which the negotiation takes place. Then, the you know, perceived value, the, though, I mean, the whole perception yeah. of value must play a huge part. Well, it does. I mean, for some people... Um, a Picasso, a particular Picasso has a huge value. For others, it has zero value. And mm -hmm. um, it, if someone is collecting, you know, a, one, a, a particular Picasso is different from other Picassos. You know, I mean, Picasso's an interesting artist in, in, in that respect. He's immensely prolific and went through a whole series of different periods. Um, so some of which are the, the art market has decided has particular value. I think the academic community uh, and the art historic community has assigned different value uh, to mm. different periods. Um, and that often happens. Um, they, they're not always directly correlated. Uh, and and those, values, those values change. But I think entering those negotiations um, which are asymmetrical from an informational standpoint. I mean, you don't often know why a person is selling. You often don't know um, unless you're buying um, directly from an individual, which almost never happens, um, who is selling a work. Um, so you're, there are vacuums within uh, 
within which these negotiations take place. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of those things, sorry, just to go back to, to, yeah. to your question, was a lot of those aspects do apply to negotiation in respect to the salary or something that is sort of more day to day in 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 the world that you know we all we all encounter i mean do your do your research have a clear idea of what your objective is have flexibility within that process but um i guess sort of know your worth know the you know know <laughs> know the value of what it is that you are transacting for for yourself that's the most important thing well i i'm always thinking that uh, you know most of the time i am when i'm doing a presentation i'm very often presenting to get someone to hire me so that is an enrollment conversation mm-hmm. if not a specific sales conversation i'm selling myself yeah and then you get into the whole mental images, you know, all those, all those voices in the back of your head that are going, um, that would be a place where emotion comes in. I always think if you, if you focus on the other person and what they're looking for and why they want it, that must also play a part. That certainly plays a part. Um, I think the greatest barrier to, to negotiations are the barriers we create for ourselves. I mean, that's just a general, general consideration in life, I found as, as I've gotten older. Um, and I mean, we are, uh, we're afraid of how we're perceived. We're afraid of how people will react. Um, but if we dig deeper, that fear is a fear of the emotions that we have in respect of those events. It's, you know, we're afraid to feel embarrassed. We're, af- uh, we're afraid to feel vulnerable in particular conditions. So um, I, f- I think a, a, a significant amount of introspection needs to occur. Um, and that's part uh, before those negotiations. And that's mm-hmm. part of what's important, you know, uh, it can it can take the, the the form of journaling or a pep talk or you know practice and rehearsal in front of the mirror tied to okay but why am I so fearful of asking you know for more for what my worth is uh, or um, why do I feel uh, not at ease um, of uh, letting other people know my value and my worth I mean all of those things are are self-imposed rather than um, from from an external source. Actually, that makes me think about uh, what happens when you're working with living artists, mm-hmm. and uh, and they're, you're selling they're selling their baby, or the living artist is involved in someone else's sale of their child, if you will. And I'm thinking about how this, uh, how this compares to founders who created mm-hmm. a company and inventors who've invented a product. And then you have to deal with the negotiations of getting investors or selling it. I mean, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um... It varies, I think, hugely from, from artist to artist. I mean, for some artists, they've, they've, done, they've produced a work, they don't want to see it again, they don't want to think about it, they've, they've moved on the moment they've... Um, and they're, it's part, they see it as a creative journey, stepping stone mm-hmm. process. So it's, it, it has a, an importance to them for a particular moment as they're creativity was developing in in a per, uh, in, in a particular way um for others it's you know they'll never let a a, a, a painting go it's part yeah. of it's, you know it's part or a business if, if we're you know by extension mm-hmm. go and and that that step is is quite a challenging one um a, a degree of Understanding, empathy, and sens- sensibility uh, of of that process, I think, is is, is critical um, on on our part, um, and that generally doesn't happen. Um, the 
they also approach things, um, and this is a generalization, but with a more with with a higher comfort level in in respect of creativity. So okay. they will look at um, they used to being creative in in a way they used to they might not feel incredibly comfortable with it, but certainly I would say more than you know the majority of um, management. Wait, they are used to it, or they're, they are, they, they are they're used to it. so they're yeah. accustomed to being creative. They're accustomed to being creative because okay. that was what well, you know an artist um, puts themselves out there by mm -hmm. they 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 pour their thoughts, hearts, emotions, all sorts of things on you know music and on canvas, etc. And um, with with an ultimate view of it being seen by others and, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps appreciate it. And that's a very interesting process. And it's, uh, uh, it's quite a vulnerable process in a way. Um, it's, that's not a process that the business world or the legal world um, is used to really appreciating particularly. Um, so the startup world does though. The startup world does. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, 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 I I agree with you. Um, and, um, but the rest of the world has a lot to learn, I think, from both the artistic world and the startup world. Um, and, you know, creativity certainly does have a place in business. It does have a place in law. And most successful lawyers or, or uh, individuals in business are open to that. And um, I, I think appreciate um that creative process. So um, it, it, uh, it's important to bridge that, that gap, that divide. This makes me think, uh, Filippo, that as uh, you have an international life, an international career, this is an international podcast. When you're approaching a deal or a negotiation or something, how much do you take the national origin and mindsets of the participants into account. Working with the Italians yeah. has got uh, to be different from working with the Germans or yeah. the Japanese. It's, or, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Funda it's fundamental. Um, and uh, I mean, that cultural specificity is uh, all relativism is kind of what informs greatly how negotiations are, um, are, are carried out. Um, I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. In, in, um, in the UK, when approaching a lawyer, um, the lawyer will constantly seek instructions from the client. You know, will we'll revert to the client saying, this is, you know, these are the choices, these are the uh, pros and cons of each option. We advise you to follow this path or take this decision, but the decision is is the client's. Mm -hmm. um, in Italy, a client will approach a law firm with with a problem and then perhaps not speak to the law firm for some considerable time as the law firm goes about goes about its its business. And the expectation is that the law firm will resolve the issue. It's rather a high expectation, let me say, but mm -hmm. um, the, the law firm will resolve the issue for the client. And, um, you know, British lawyers will often, when dealing with Italian clients, revert to the client. They also have an obligation to take instructions from the client. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult for an Italian client to understand and appreciate. They, they could see that as... Um, you're the lawyers, why are you asking me? Um, and without understanding the, the, the cultural and um, sort of practical differences um, that e exist in these different realities, negotiations or discussions or, or confidence in, within these relationships um, can come to a grinding halt. I mean, uh, so it's immensely important. And when I think the presumption of understanding or awareness of 
of different cultural contexts is something that we just need to remove from um, from the equation. So, you know, if we're working uh, with people in Japan, as, as, as you mentioned, then it's very important for us to have uh, and leverage the resources of someone that has an understanding of, of, of that context. And ah. so common, so a communality can be found in approach. You know, often there's a negotiation about how the negotiation takes place, which is more important than the negotiation itself or just as important part of, of, of the negotiation. But um, it's intrinsically tied uh, and... Um, it, it it just can't be it can't be ignored. Uh, I mean, things stop very quickly mm. unless uh, unless a, a significant amount of focus is placed on understanding the position of of the other individual. It's no different from um, you know the, the measuring, evaluating um, the negotiating position, needs, wants, etc. of uh, the counterparty in, in, in a negotiation. It's just part of the picture. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's always, you know, make it, make it about them. It's what I've been saying over and over again. I wanted to ask you, you were talking about the work you're doing as an advisor and mm-hmm. how you are helping um, how you're helping people who've maybe been the victims of so-called experts. When somebody says, you have to buy this because no. it's, it's such and so, and I'm the expert and I'm telling you that. What's the fun part for you? What makes you light up? So, I mean, I love art. I love being surrounded by art. I love looking at art. Um, that's not unique. I mean, we live, all of us live in houses, apartments, uh, you know, rooms that have something on our walls. Um, we've had images on walls for thousands of years before we were writing. Uh, mm-hmm. And we find ourselves in, in, in this very skewed context where um, for those that are fortunate enough to have a roof over their heads you know they who aren't uh, dealing with food insecurity or uh, who have employment and there are lots of people who aren't in, 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 in those mm-hmm. conditions but um, we have art all around us we have images all around us now more than ever yeah um, it, 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 it's a visual reality that, that we inhabit. We're bombarded by a sense of importance of the image. And yet, um, something that is, all, on one hand, all pervasive, um, but also gives us great joy and pleasure um, in, in, in any context. I mean, there is a reason why we all put up a poster or a painting in our living room. You know, we want people, we, we like to look at it. We also want people uh, to see it in that um, it has through history been a, a, a fundamental piece of that, this is what I am, who I am, mm-hmm. um, aspect of communication. And um, the the... But yet the language and the market that surrounds uh, the purchasing of art is something that is, um, in many cases, quite intimidating for a lot of people. Um, So uh, helping, firstly, people understand what it is that they like and that it's okay for them to like all sorts of different things. There's no, um, we shouldn't just like what... Um, one of the, you know, top five mega galleries should be telling us we like. And, and in reality, they're not telling us, they're not telling all of us, they're, they're informing a particular clientele that can afford those works, that can mm-hmm. um, work uh, with those artists uh, in, in a particular way. But I think that bleeds 
um, into how art is seen by by many. I mean, it's not a it's not a purchase that's carried out um, every day. Often, art is uh, for those that are fortunate enough to, to to have had art given to them or passed down within families. That's how they acquire art. But um, there's um, there's something unnerving or unsettling for many about stepping through a gallery, through the doors of a gallery, and asking questions. And um, the majority of gallery, gallery own, uh, owners um, don't necessarily want that. They want uh, people to be involved. They desperately, now more than ever, want people to, to visit their galleries, to ask them questions, to speak to them, to engage in that process. But um, so many are inhibited or, or um, just feel uncomfortable. And so the work that I'm able to do with uh, either fledgling collectors or purchasers at, at all price levels is something that I find over time has uh, certainly um, emotionally is more rewarding. If I'm able to help someone understand that they like, I don't know, um, Pacific Northwest landscapes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why they like those works is because they remember growing up in a house or there was a particular experience where there was one of these works that was involved and uh, they like the feeling that these works give them. And I, I uh, am able to enhance the comfort level that they have with that understanding, um, that might contribute, and this is my sort of greatest wish, to, to them having an interest or a passion that will stay with them uh, and that they will develop over time. And that's, uh, I find that more rewarding than the, um, the than some of the kind of big tickets um, work that I've been, uh, I've been involved in. Uh, this, this has been fascinating. I'd like to end with, I when there's a, there's an old saying that the more you work in the, in the bowels of something and in the, in the nitty gritty of something, the less you appreciate the actual product. Is there a time you can think of where you walked into a room or someone's home or you just saw something and you were taken away by the beauty of it. Just absolutely jolted out of your, your every day and transported. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does happen. I think we have to be, we have to be open to that experience. We have to be open to that mindset. And it hasn't always been that way for me. I mean, there have been plenty of times where I've uh, been working on uh, particular disputes maybe that involved a number of, of, of works or a collection and um, in the past there have been circumstances where some of those pieces I may never even have looked at um, it was a painting that was in dispute rather than you know a painting by X or Y which had these you know particular characteristics so I think fortunately I've evolved and have <laughs> sort of understood that that for me is um, I've, I find that so important from, from the point of view of, of what I need. So, so I, well, how do, how do we keep ourselves connected to the wonder of it all? Um, I think making a conscious effort and a point of, seeking that wonder um it it's very difficult for it to to occur if we're not open to it or or um you know are not uh, thinking about it i i was recently in chicago and um i make a point of whatever city i'm in um and often the 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 diary is is very busy or i will always carve out time to walk certain uh, for a certain time through the city and go to a museum or a gallery at least one um and i found um i was in chicago and i was uh, i went to the art institute uh, there and 
it was, you know, beautiful sunny day and I went looking for something and I found so much more. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, there were uh, paintings that I'd forgotten uh, were even there and um, sort of turning into a room um, and seeing, uh, being surprised both by the presence of a particular work, but then feeling the impact of that, of, of, of that work, uh, seeing, appreciating its technique or, um, is, is, is something that's incredibly moving, uh, can be moving, but we have to go and look for it. That's, uh, that's what I would say. Well, that, so reminding ourselves to go look for the marvels around what we do. They're I think there. it's a, yeah. They're there. They're there. <laughs> Filippo Petteni, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being part of Speakers Who Get Results. I'm really, it's been a, a delight to get to know you and, and hear your thoughts about a part of, about a world that I'm not part of. So I really enjoyed it. It was my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. Please, if you had a good time, like us on YouTube. Please uh, share, like us, leave us a review on iTunes. Share it, tell your friends, and I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.